But, and we'll talk about this when we get to Total War, how they would build up propaganda to build up hatred. So as the war went on, it became more and more to look at the Germans as look at these animals doing that. Okay. So that's part of the reason why that Christmas truce could happen in 1914. But like 1916, at least not to that extent. And even though live and let live kind of go on for the whole war in a way, all this land here, the stands, they were all that was all promised to the Ottomans. So they were promised all this stuff. Now, Italy, they were on the outside looking in. But Britain and France, in a series of secret agreements, promised them pretty much everything they wanted. They promised them big hunks of Austria. For example, all this land here and this entire coastline will go to Italy in these secret agreements. People, they were making secret agreements all over. In fact, this one with Italy would be huge. Italy, of course, did not get all of that. In fact, they nearly were knocked out of a war. This resentment would eventually lead to fascism and Benito Mussolini. And also a revulsion against secret agreements. That didn't last all that long. And the last one we have to mention here, even though it's others, obviously, but Bulgaria. Because all roads lead through Sofia and the capital of Bulgaria. And Germany was able to convince Bulgaria that they would get big hunks of Serbia. And so that's where you get the central powers. Germany, Austria, Bulgaria, and the Ottomans. That's it. It's amazing how well they did. But you also really see why they're called the central powers. Look where they're at. But the thought was, if we widen the war, we could find something on the edge to weaken the enemy. It just spread the misery. And then, in 1915, the populations of both countries were told will win the war this year. Politicians said, in fact, a lot of politicians believed it. But that wasn't the reality. Everybody in the know, in the know realized 1915 would be a horrible year, but not end the war. Germany looked at it like this. Okay, we're now surrounded, our worst case scenario, but we'll hold out in the West. We'll dig elaborate trenches. Two, three, four lines of trenches, deep dugouts to protect us all from artillery, so they won't need as many men in the West. Let the French and British beat their heads against our good fortified lines, and then turn around and win in the East. Not rush out, but also take care of Serbia once and for all for Austria. The Allies, Britain had to literally build an army. And they did it all in 1915 with volunteers, millions of volunteers. And the thing was, you can't just simply throw them in a uniform and here's a rifle and go fight. Not only do the men have to be trained, but they need thousands of officers, thousands of sergeants. So it's gonna take a year. They didn't tell the people that it's gonna be a full year before we really get into it. In fact, in 1915, to make up the difference of that full year, a lot of colonial troops, Canadians or Australians, they would be used. And this would lead to real problems down the road for Britain. But not only that, what they would do is they'd raise regiments, regiments of about a thousand men, and they would go into a neighborhood or go into a small village. And they say, they call them pals regiment. They say, join with your pals, all of you together. So they go into secondary school, high school. And they go into all the 18 year olds and say, join together as a group. You all can fight together with your pals. And that's a pretty effective way to get people to recruit. Think about it. No one wants to look like a coward in front of their friend. Let's all go join. But it's going to be horrible when the war really happens. Think about the Battle of the Somme. 20,000 British soldiers died in one day. So these are just a few of the regiments that led the attack. What if it was from just one neighborhood? The Palace Regiment in London, that's like a city block, or two blocks. And they all go fight together. And they're that first regiment that gets slaughtered. What's going to happen to that neighborhood after the war? A whole age would just be erased. And those who survive never be the same. So you might have neighborhoods Well, there might be, you know, war's gonna affect everywhere, but a lot of people get killed, but nothing, you know, just, you knew them, but then neighborhood where they're all gone. 
or a village. They're all gone. Same thing would happen in Canada and Australia. There would be elements of the United States. They don't recruit that way now. It's an issue of national guard. They like to break them up. They actually have to go because of that reason. And so, not only that, Russia doesn't have weapons. The big thing, I guess I should put on ammunition. They didn't have ammunition. Hard to fight a war if you don't have enough ammunition. It would take a year. The British and the French, but especially the British, are going to try to break through the Ottoman Empire. This strait is called the Dardanelles. But the place they'll land is this rocky peninsula called Gallipoli. And they want to break into here so they can get supplies to the Russians. You can imagine how important it would be for the British and the French to have the Russians pull down the mess of the British army, or vice versa. Yeah. Did they have like Well, even today, our planes are big enough to carry more than just a trickle. And planes back then were tiny. But planes can't carry them. Just a tiny little amount. Everything's relative. Yeah, I carry a bunch of people, but not the hundreds of thousands of tons. And so they all, everybody tried, especially the Allies, on the periphery. Like colonies and air, on the edges, hoping to weaken them for the next year. Yeah. Oh, why didn't they go through Norway, Sweden, Denmark area? Arctic. Cool. And there was no, there was a couple harbors here. Uh, Burmask is right here. But no railroad yet. Okay. Stalin would have that built. The cost of buildings. But Stalin. On the Russian front, the Germans would achieve their victory. They would win one of the biggest victories in world history. Remember, Tannenberg is important. Tarnal Gorlitz, which happened right here in Austria, it changed the entire course of Russian history. The Russian Empire never recovered. I mean, literally, never. In two years, they'd be gone. In three years, the Tsar would be dead. It never recovered from this defeat. The Germans defeated the Russians here. The Germans had the Austrians, but German control, and pushed the Russians back 500 miles. All of this land, which is immense, including all what is now Poland, Lithuania, much of, then they called it White Russia, but it's Belarus. And the Ukraine, it should be Ukraine, but I grew up with it as the Ukraine. I can't help it. The Ukraine? Yeah, you, the country is Ukraine, but I would say the Ukraine. And you know, I'm not, not supposed to, but I can't quit. Yeah. Oh, I can't. Yeah, I don't know why. So, a huge defeat. And this is what we got to get. Germany won in the East. They won. They beat the Russians, but the Russians didn't quit, it, and the empire didn't quit. The Germans could have taken more, but they frankly did not have enough men to hold this vast area. They didn't want to try to hold it all. They won, but the problem is the Russians did not quit for the Germans. You know, the, the Russian empire destroyed itself, I guess you could argue it saved France, saved Britain. So we're going to have fronts all over. Remember the Civil War and other things? You want to talk about like an army being camp and they maneuver and fight a battle. Here, with these mass armies, they're going to hold entire lines. So don't write these down. I'm just going to tell you all the fronts. We'll come back to a certain front. There are obviously a couple you got to know. But like we're going to have the Western Front, the Russian Front, soon the Italian Front, the Serbian Front, which will become the Balkan Front, the Slovakian or the uh, Solokian Front. Soon to be the Romanian front, the Caucasus front, the Mesopotamian front, the Palestinian front. Do you get the point there? <clears throat> All they did is widen the war, but nobody clearly won. And, at least at first, then no one really clearly won at the end either. And meteorology was a brand new science. You can imagine how important it would be to know the weather during war, so they really pushed it. So terms from the war would bleed into meteorology. For example, what do you call it? If a cold air mass runs into a warm air mass, what do you call that? That's a front. You hear a warm front coming in, that's from the war. That's why they call it that. Just little things like that. I should add, I can check the weather. Do you see it's going to snow between 70 and 80 feet on Monday? No, no, they will not close school. That's ridiculous. 
They so only close. close. No, no. They only close school if there is a threat that it might get icy the next day, right? Remember last year? We'll be perfectly fine. I got snowshoes. We'll go right in. So 70, 80, maybe 90 feet. I checked the forecast. So it's going to be anywhere from four inches to 70 feet. So dress well. So with that, yeah, they won't shut the school down ever. After last year's debacle of shutting it down and trying to be not that bad, my guess is we'll never do it again. So here's one of the fronts. The Italian front would be about 12,000 feet in the Julian Alps. And these are, okay, this is one place I really would love to go to. This part, I guess it is just unreal. And the Caporetto right here along that valley, I guess, unreal. Because there's like three or four thousand, um, or there's twelve thousand foot mountains, and then three or four thousand feet down to a river valley, just sheer cliffs to back up. So it must just be unreal. And I was just reading an article about the difficulty of fighting up there, where thousands, hundreds of thousands would die. Italy nearly was knocked out of the war. It didn't work out well for them because of climate change. Glaciers are retreating so fast that they are finding hundreds of bodies that they could not bury back in 1917, 1918, and they're finding them now. So one of the many elements of climate change, and it's one of the things I, I mean, they knew it, but it still was unexpected how many they're finding. Yeah, and that's, I just read that on Saturday. And so that was one part of the battle. And then the Ottomans, the Allies thought the Ottomans would just roll up. They called them the sick man of Europe. They just thought they would fall apart. As it turned out, no. The Ottomans would last to the bitter end, and they fought much better than anybody dreamed. There would be three huge fronts, and also rebellion within the Ottoman Empire. And I put down the fronts, but you do not need to write these down. Okay, You do not need to write down these fronts. So here's the Palestinian front. And this would help lead to issues with a Jewish state down the road. They promised Jews there. I mean, it's just incredible all the stuff that went on. The Mesopotamian front right there, another word for Mesopotamia, which is the land between the rivers, is Iraq. And the British would create a country out of three separate provinces called Iraq. Nothing to see there. No problems would come down the road from there. And here's the Caucasus front. And right here, there's a group of people on the Russian side and the Ottoman side that were Christians. They lived actually fairly peacefully within the Ottoman Empire, which is Muslim, called the Armenians. And soon the Turks would believe that the Armenians would be people they could not trust. They might revolt. And part of the reason was because in the South, people down here wanted their own country. Remember nationalism in the Balkans? The same thing was happening here. They wanted an Arab state. And so... Out of this would form, and do get this down, the Arab Revolt. Well, the British would help the Arabs revolt against the Turks. And there's going to be a just an unbelievable movie. It's fairly true, but they add, you know, it's always a poetic license. One of the greatest movies ever made called Lawrence of Arabia. And it's won multiple Academy Awards. It was just on... A Turner Movie Classics, because they're doing all the Oscar-winning movies. It won like seven Oscars. And it's one of the best movies I've ever seen. I'm not kidding. It's fantastic. And not only it's a great story, the acting is unreal, but the scenery of the desert is amazing. Now, there's only one copy of it. You need seven, eight days to watch it. Just get comfortable. Don't plan on moving for something. It's about three and a half hours. Maybe a little bit longer. It's it's one of the greatest movies I've ever seen. Hmm? What's, your favorite movie? What's my favorite movie? The Moment Now, Lawrence of Arabia. So with that, no, it's a great movie. It's one. It is one of my favorite, at least of this genre. And the thing that's going to come out of this is they're going to promise Arabs independent countries. Are they going to give the Arabs independent countries? Absolutely not. That will cause no conflict down the road. That's me being facetious one more time. For example, the French are going to demand a little place called Syria. Nothing to see there. So many of the problems today go right back to World War I. It's mind-boggling. 
And Americans, for the most part, don't know. They haven't forgotten them for good reason. And so, one more place is Gallipoli. I mentioned that right before here, where the, the British and French attacked there, and it was a disaster. They got bogged down in this horrible little peninsula. This actually, ironically, would make modern Turkey, but also the horrific fighting here along these coves in this rocky, dry place would make Australia. Those are Australians. So many Australians would go there. In fact, uh, when the place he attacked right here would be called Anzac Cove. Australia, New Zealand, Armageddon, Cove. 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 And Australia is this really big island. It had separate little colonies. But this battle of Gallipoli would lead to Australian nationalism and make them to want to become one country of Australia. It is like the thousands of Australians every year make the pilgrimage to Gallipoli. And another very good movie, Australian movie called Gallipoli, came out about 1980. And it would make uh, this actor who I think anybody, most people can't stand, his name's Mel Gibson, but it would make him. Do you know who Mel Gibson is? You like him? Hmm? No! No, I don't. And it's heard a lot of really, really, really bad movies. But Gallipoli's pretty good. But the Western fronts where the war would have to be won. Mel Gibson used to live near Absorption. So, the Western Front. And these are French soldiers in a hastily done trench. It looks like they just wiped the ditch. But that's 1914. But within a few months, they learn you dig or you die. And soon, very elaborate trenches. Here's a generic shot of trenches with no man land, communication, support trenches. But look at the reality. It looks almost the same, doesn't it? That's pretty incredible. And this was taken from an observation balloon. So they send these balloons up about 15,000 feet to observe the enemy. And that's a job you do not want. So you're 15, 17,000 feet up. It's bitterly cold. And what gets the balloon up there? What's holding it up? Hydrogen. Where do you think the first parachutes came from? And balloon busting was a thing to knock down these observation balloons. And so here is no man's land. So also the Germans are the ones who dug in better because they're the ones going to hold out while the French and the British are going to try to drive them out. And the Americans come take these trenches. Which one of these two are the German trenches? Yeah, does this look more organized? And it's not that the French and the British could do it, but they purposely did not because they wanted their men attacked. And every night, men would go into no man's land to do patrols, try to get prisoners to gather intelligence. They'd lay barbed wire. But in daylight, if you're out, in fact, if you're exposed in daylight, it won't take long. The snipers were covering every part of the line. Yeah. How many miles is that going to be? Like in No Man's Land? Oh, in No Man's Land, it depends where it's at. There are parts like along the Somme, you know, right around here, or up here in Belgium, where they can be 30 meters apart, which is nothing. But there are parts down here, especially in the rugged area here, where they might be a mile apart. So clearly, you'd want to be in this region. In fact, that's what they would do. Humans just could not handle being in the trenches for that long. And so they would rotate both sides. So the normal allied procedure would be a week in a really tough area, a week in a bad area, then a week off. If they had to be on there constantly more than a week, they'd start going nuts. In World War II, for example, both sides for the entire war, they didn't have enough reserves to do that. So men never really got off the front for maybe more than just a day. And so you're going to see just men. Um, there's lines beginning to break down. Battle fatigue, they call it. Vietnam, even worse for combat soldiers. Today, it's even worse because there's so few combat soldiers. Yeah. So, in some areas of Norway, sometimes was it close enough where they could throw out grenades and yell at Or yell at insults or, or say to each other. You know, I mean, kind of the weird little thing about live and let live. And, you know, it's not straight. I know why. Yeah, just one section. 
Or if a guy gets into the trench, they just can't shoot up and down the trench. They're kind of isolated. But also, this means longer trench, because they exact some more weapons. You put more men in it. And so that's how they dug them. It was pretty horrific. And yes, they would tunnel underneath. Remember that story I told you about the crater? They would do that this year, too. There were tunnel, tunnel wars in World War One. There's still some of the tunnels exist. And how long would it take to make these? Well, you know, it'd be a thousand men digging for, for every half, you know, for every half mile, so fairly fast. But hard work. You know, they dig a trench real fast and then improve them, improve them, improve them. But you you're motivated. Trust me. You're motivated. <laughs> and here's what shot inside the trench. That's a British trench. And that's after the Germans took a trench line in 1918. Look at all the dead bodies. There'd be bodies everywhere. Here are Germans getting ready to attack. Here is an American looking over the parapet in 1918. Yes, peeking over the top. And here is a British soldier in the Palestinian front. And you see what he's doing with his pit helmet? Remember that where they put it up in bed? I mean, by the way, you think they ever took snipers prisoner? Never. You can imagine how much they hated snipers. So snipers obviously they are for effective, but they never take prisoner. And here's some of the funds of trench life. What are they picking out? Lice. Lice. If you can't get your feet out of water, it begins to wrinkle, the skin begins to die, it's very exposed to fungus. And one of these fungus can lead to that wonderful thing, trench foot. And trench foot, I mean, literally there's stories about guys pulling the socks off and ripping off all their toes. And the thing about it is, what happens is this fungus gets in and blood doesn't circulate. That's why the skin wrinkles when you take a bath, blood isn't circulating. So it can't clean it out. So the fungus begins to grow and it kills the, the skin. It rots. And frostbite makes it worse. Same deal. You know, frostbite can get blood flow. And let's be clear about it. It's not like you take your socks off and go, oh God, my feet's good. My foot's gone. No, it hurts really bad. The number one thing in every military in the world to this day, keep your feet dry. You want to be punished and you're in the military, have wet feet. There's a big deal in Vietnam, you can imagine. Keep your feet dry. Or this. Here, that's a little French rat fighting. They all did it. Look at those rats. That's a good day's grab. Look at those monsters. I could feed a family of four for weeks. <laughs> and then, now that's a that's a Belgian trench. That was 10 years ago. And they're all there. It, they're it's pretty amazing. Something that you into, it's a little weird, but also I, you know, just I don't want to do it. That's cave. That's going underneath. That's a tunnel. And some spelunkers, I guess, do that. Go through them. No way. No way. I'm a little claustrophobic, and I don't like bats. Does anyone here like bats? I mean, bats. Okay, fine. They eat insects or kill zeppelins or whatever. But, but they're flying rats. And if you ever walk into a room. You ever walk into a cave or, or like a like an old barn that's covered with a roof with rat with rats? Same deal, bats. It's disconcerting. Has anyone ever done that? Walk in, there's just bats covering. Them. Have you ever seen uh, the Lost Boys? Huh? Have you ever seen the Lost Boys? That's a true story. That's a good movie. And then they sleep like bats. You know? That's sweet. You know what I'm talking about? This is what we call a non sequitur. Yes, well, it's not quite. Yeah, yeah, it's about it's about vampires. Watch Lawrence of Arabia. So, <laughs> so here are pretty soldiers about ready to go over the top. But it's like this for everyone when they actually did attack, and you know what's going to happen. Machine guns are waiting. High explosive artillery decided to to drop right on you. And I love this right when he crossed over. You see it? You see what he's doing? You see it? Look at his hand. He's doing this, like, ha ha! That was a big insult. I think it's kind of funny that he did that. So, I hope he made it. That was scary. I, mean, you, I, I can't even talk about that. Your stomach is in throat right before that. And the weapons, 
They weren't necessarily new, but they would be improved throughout the war. One of the weapons that everybody thinks about, I think, for obvious reasons, were machine guns. Because they would still use the tactic, not a heck of a lot different than the Civil War, fighting weapons that would go 500 to 1,000 rounds a minute. That's an American with a Lewis gun, a machine gun. Those are Austrians. That's German. And you notice, see this little, they're water cooled, so they would pump water in to keep it cold. Eventually, they're air cooled, they have better steel they can use it. That's what they are today. And I just thought that was a great picture with the Germans. You can imagine they hated machine gunners too, like they hated snipers. Yeah. Whenever you see a machine gun like that, why are there like three people? Like there's one to feed the ammo, one to shoot. What's the third one? Well, normally they would have a crew of three or four, but the other one is to pump the water through to keep it cool. Back okay. then. Most of them now they have two, but like a squad in the infantry, like by World War II, they'd each, each squad would have a machine gun, and so the rest would be hold, carrying ammunition one because they're oh. too heavy. And so they'd all have ammunition. And these would have big tripods, so they're all ready there to move the machine gun forward. Okay. Which, that's pretty much what squads do, they protect the machine gun. And even though they were big killers, machine guns were the key. Eventually they come up with handheld machine guns called submachine guns. Those are coming down the road. Here's one they tried to put on a bike, did not work. Here they tried to have a mobile wall. They would have rifles and machine guns in like those little things. That they, I showed you yesterday that they would crawl. That one didn't work. Here they thought they could rat, they could mine a rat. <laughs> so stick a pencil explosive into a rat and throw it at the enemy. I'm trying to figure out the logic of that. And this one is as bad as it looks. Put a bomb in a dog, have the dog run into the enemy trench and then blow up the bomb. They tried this with dogs, cats, uh, other animals, pigeons were one. They even had a pigeon. They tried in both world wars. Pigeon guided bombs. Dolphins. Dolphins would they mine a dolphin? They have to swim under a boat and blow the dolphin up under a ship where it's weakest. Uh, yeah, I agree. It's horrible, but it's also it just gives you an idea how desperate they become. Speaking of other weapons, artillery is the big killer. Though. Artillery was the one that they feared the most. High explosives would rain down absolute death. And here we yeah, are, riding on a, on a 250 millimeter shell. These are Americans, those are Brits, uh, those are Germans. That's called a trench mortar with a blob and like that. But same kind of deal. Those were the big killers. And those, if they hit anywhere near you, there's nothing you can do. They blow you apart. And they would have shells they packed with iron or Steel balls, here is one from a farm in Belgium. Farmer gave it to me. Very nice guy. They find this all the time. They find unexploded shells, like I say, said before. Ten Belgians every year are killed or wounded by finding unexploded rounds from World War I every year to this day. They have a whole battalion in their army that does nothing but explode unexploded munitions from World War I. To this day. So I'll let you look at that. It's just an iron. Ah, you broke it! Yeah, it's just an iron ball with rust on it. Cheaply, crudely made. But actually, they called that shrapnel named after a British captain named Harry Shrapnel. That was actually his name. But the big shrapnel was this. And now they specifically designed shells. They started doing it then. To have the steel casings that when they exploded, would put out a thousand jagged shards of metal that would fly as fast as a bullet and rip apart human flesh. Just tear it apart. And if you imagine like a big thing tumbling, how bad a wound that would make, you would cut off limbs, cut off heads, and it would be a dirty, dirty wound. Those are the big killers of war. Shrapnel is the one that everybody feared. Shrapnel. 90% of the casualties in World War I would be of this. 90% of World War II, more so. And so that's the big killer. High explosives. And I just put this in there because I thought that was a great picture. The German cavalry with a lance and a gas mask. Can't make that one up. But flamethrowers were also invented. And the Germans invented them first, of course. The, but here's French flamethrowers. Everyone did it. And this one, a little more modern, 
It was always a two-man crew, but normally for this German team, you had the gunner who aimed it, and then a guy holding a tank. The big thing about flamethrowers, it keeps your head down. If a jet of, of flaming gasoline comes at you, you duck. In fact, if you're not sure, maybe you should write that down. Duck if fire comes at you. Do you see the problem with flamethrowers? Those highly trained three-man crews, how long do you think they last? Not long at all, did they? Volunteers? Yeah, they would pay them extra in the German army, give them a little better food. But yeah. Maybe not quite as much horse. Here's another weapon that was invented. Who invented the tank? The British. They saw it as like a land battleship that could go over no man's land and then keep going over the trenches. And they called it a code name, water tank. Meaningless in reality, but the name tank stunk. Stunk. Snunk. And here's a British, that was their main tank. And it could whiz along at 20 tons. It could whiz along at, I'm talking, I'm not kidding when I say this, three to four miles an hour before it broke down. They always broke down. They had one engine for each tread. So they had like half a guy, two guys riding for 12 man crews. And then he stands up with this lever and they'd be kind of rocking back and forth. And when they would say, you know, right turn, how would they do it? Stop. The man on the ride would pull, brake, the other guy would push forward. And one engine broke down or got hit, it would just spin in a circle, right? So they were pretty uh, haphazard, but by the end of the war, these did at least give the Allies some advantage. These are French tanks, but those are Americans using them. They could, with these light tanks, could whiz along at six to seven miles an hour. The Germans did not make many tanks. They didn't want to waste resources. They only made about a dozen of those monstrosities, and they were really good at breaking down. And so they would just go about 20 feet and break down. I love the fact that they're all taking a ride. And trust me, it'll be a short ride. So with that, tanks will become a big deal after the war. But the Russians made me, you don't have to write this down, I just put it down there because I thought it was awesome. They called it the Tsar tank. It had this big wheel pushed from behind. Look how big it is. And yeah, there's a museum in near Moscow where they have one. And I really, 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 really want to go. Wouldn't that be awesome? I want to be that guy standing here. Look at it compared to an armored car. So, one more weapon that its potential would turn out to be unlimited. Planes. At first they were used for reconnaissance. But, hey, we're flying over the enemy. Why not bomb? The first bombers. And there's reconnaissance. We don't want them to see us. Let's take pot shots at them. Thus the first fighters. At first, they just, the reconnaissance pilots would fly next to each other and just salute each other. Then they started shooting at each other. And by 1917, they started making very effective planes. So this is a German plane. The company was Fokker, so it's a Fokker DR1. This is a Fokker D7, probably the best plane in the war. Tri-wing, really maneuverable. The Red Baron flew one of these. That's a British plane, a Sopwith Camel. You know who flew a Sopwith Camel? Snoopy, Snoopy, exactly. Snoopy flew this. That's a Spod 11. That's a French plane, but the Ameri that's an American one. And they were very maneuverable. Had to be very light because the engines were weak, so it's made out of balsa wood, so it's fabric on the outside. If they got a bullet hole through them, they would sew it up or put a patch on so they look like a quilt if they were actually in combat. And there's only one place strong enough to put a machine gun right over the engine. So do you see the problem why they don't have fighter planes had a really issue of land having to land really quick. They shoot the propellers off. The French started putting steel plates on the inside of the propellers, and that gave them a little little bit of an advantage in 1916, but what's the problem with that? Right back in your face. The Germans invented a little timing mechanism that every time the propeller came up, the machine gun would not shoot at that instant, so they could shoot through the propellers. And once both sides adopted that, they would go from just a few planes to, by the end of 1917, thousands of planes in the air. And what do you call a pilot that shoots down five planes or more? Which is almost impossible to do. 
You ever heard the term ace? That's five planes. Baron von Richthofen for the Germans shot down eight. The leading American ace, Eddie Rickenbacker, shot down 26. Pretty amazing. The leading Allied race was, uh, ace was uh, Bishop. Bishop shot down seven. What was it? Eric Bong in World War II, an American shot down 90. A couple of Germans shot down almost 400. Why is it so difficult to shoot down if they have such terrible water? Because they're shooting at you. All right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So you're trying to stay alive. So you really do that. You're that. You're just And most people don't want to You know? Now, Sophie, you have a software camera, right? Oh, there you go. Yeah. Um, so in uh, We Didn't Start the Fire by Billy Joel, when it says, does it like say the um, movie, like the, what was the movie? In? Lawrence of Arabia. Yeah, yeah, Lawrence of Arabia and then British Beatle Media. And, like, this, is that what it was like referring yeah. to? Oh, okay. Yeah, Lawrence of Arabia, was it came out in the early 60s and the Beatles came right after that. So, talk with Camel. Oh. Yeah, Camel. Snoopy flew us off with Camel. Oh, why not? Hey, Stop with cubs a little small. I love planes. Go, there's a place in, in uh, Arizona. It's a World War One fighter museum. All the old World War One fighters. So cool. Go sound. <laughs> You know, I hate the Patriots, and it's good to get more reasons to hate the Patriots. <laughs> You know what I'm talking about? Yes, yeah. the guy got arrested. Not only that, but also it appears as though the whole the, the whole ring was a series of things set up by all these billionaires yes. and millionaires, and it's all a human trafficking. I love America. It's awesome. Yeah. It appears to be part of a big ring of human trafficking. And my nephew, who's your age, is a Patriots fan, so I immediately sent it to him. Oh, no. Made me feel better. <laughs> so, let's quick do this. We have, um, we got to win this race, people. Major funding for American. Oh, awesome. Where are you going? Yeah. 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 American experience is also made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. And you got all the monuments. 
nobody joins the party. If you're a friend, I'll be my country. As a 17, it was plausible. The first time I did this piece of stuff, I drove at the urging of a father of it. And the 17, it was. Oh, awesome. That. My major funding for American experience is provided by the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation. Give me one sec, I have to redo a couple of my things. Okay, everyone, just go take your notes out. Let's talk a little bit about Jonestown. Okay, so that won't hurt you now. You're not the soul. I did the, did the Bible. Not yet. Okay, so let's go take your notes out. Let's go to put down Jonestown. And we're going to a little bit about Jonestown, and we're going to watch the beginning of a video about Jonestown, and then we will finish it tomorrow. I don't quit. Look. Is she in the No. No, and I will finish it on Monday, Tuesday. And I bought to this is going to give cults a bad name. What a weird thing to say. But this would be such a shocking event that's hard to even comprehend what's going to happen in Jonestown and Gaia. And then the story about the whole people's temple will be just unbelievable and wrap it all together it puts in every element of what a cult is all those characteristics of a cult and puts it all in there combined with this apocalyptic idea that they'll develop or we must keep together and then the event that would culminate in 1979 in Jonestown that would culminate in just like changing everyone's attitude towards cults and so Let's talk just a little bit about this, and then we're going to watch just a fantastic video about this. And then talking to Mr. Diola one more time, I will show you one more thing. I must show you the Jesus of Siberia, one more call. Some of you have seen it, but I, I promised him I show it. I agree with you. I should not listen to Mr. Diola, but I'm going to do it this time. And hmm? what? Wait, your name is Oh yeah, you're Brianna. I forgot. <laughs> That's your call with him, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> Got a new identity. That's Jim Jones at the People's Temple. Jim Jones would be the leader, and it it also has elements that some of you you're gonna look at this and it's gonna be like this seems 
pretty good. It's not all bad. And then it'll get bad. It will make a turn that will blow you away. So, here's Joe. And a couple things about it. In the 70s would be a wave of stories about cults. And some were almost humorous. So let's turn around. Like, for example, the Harry Krishnas. And, and Connor, you're doing that. And the thing about Harry Krishnas, they had this... I'm just telling you what people, like in the popular culture, they have them in movies where they would pray. In fact, the big thing was they'd always be in airports. They'd come and solicit you, solicit money and try to get you to join in airports. In fact, in, that, in 1981, that's why you notice there's no solicitation in airports. They banned it because of Harry Christians. So if you go in the airport, that's why you don't see that kind of thing. That's illegal. They'd be, it was just like part of what was Harry Christian. I thought this was going right by the luggage check. And one of the great comedy movies of this era, 1980, the movie Airplane, which for some of you are probably a little bit too sophisticated for, but if you've seen it, you know what I mean. Really? They have a whole very humorous scene about Harry Krishners and others in an airport. It's really well done. Very realistic. And so, another one, though, it's called like was the Manson family. Charles Manson and his followers, it wasn't like all the elements of a cult, but you see enough of the elements to say it was cult like. And they committed a number of very high profile, brutal murders that would seem to personify not just the fear of cults, but also the fear of young people. And that's who cults recruit people your age to about mid 20s. That's the prime age. That's what we talk about this week. See? This is a warning. And there's Charles Manson. And I have not decided if I'm going to do Charles Manson this year. Should I do Charles Manson? Yes. Manson is what? It's a great story. You know, that would actually be an interesting thing to do, Manson, because for various reasons, which I'll tell you, involving the Beach Boys, but <laughs> Charles Manson, his, would, he would, yes, kill his family would kill an actress by the name of Sharon Tate, who was pregnant. And she was an up-and-coming actress, but she was going places. And her husband was this young director named Roman Polanski. And Polanski would direct some of the greatest movies of this era, multi-academy award-winning movies, including that movie Chinatown, which I thought about one of them, you know, a short movie, or a movie, kind of a short unit. That actually would fit in with Charles Manson and then do Chinatown. It's a great movie. He's a horrible person, I'm gonna be clear about it, but just because you're good at directing does not mean that you're good at other things. <laughs> yes, he is now wanted for, for rape, and so he can't come back to the United States. Yet he'd win an Academy Award, he could not come and accept it for the movie called The Pianist because of that. <laughs> good movie. So, here's the People's Temple. And this did, yes, it had the elements of a cult, but it also seemed innocuous, but it seemed to be bringing people together. And one of the things about it was that, yes, it was started by a white man from Indiana, but it was multiracial and it appealed to people of all kinds. In fact, to many who were seeing the idea of the United States truly becoming that multiracial, multi ethnic nation, this really represented like what could be which also in a way makes it even more tragic. And there it is in San Francisco. And that building's still there. I took a walking tour in San Francisco and went by the building. It's now a mission. And Jim Jones was the pastor. And they, do, they did a number of films to recruit people. And these pictures would be in the video we'll see. And there's a number of them just saying how you can trust him, believe him. He will lead us to a better life. About all this coming together. No racial differences, no sexual differences. At least that's what he claimed. And here he is in his family where he, he adopted children from all over. Here he is jumping into the audience. Isn't that a, that's actually a pretty cool picture. When he's jumping in and it's, I guess his serve is, or when he would actually give service was just this raucous affair that bring people from all over together. He would um, win the Martin Luther King Humanitarian Award in 1977, one of the first people in the United States 
to win that new award. Here he is meeting with Governor Jerry Brown, who was governor in the late 70s, left office, and then literally just left office again as governor of California. So here he is back in the 70s meeting him. Here he is with um, prominent California politicians. Uh, here he is, there's Jim Jones, and there's vice presidential nominee Walter Mondale, who is Jimmy Carter's vice presidential nominee, would become vice president. In fact, he would meet Rosalind Carter, Jimmy Carter's wife, while they were running, and he was very involved politically. And so he was well known, even though there were stories about him. And then he left. Now, there will be reasons why and went to Guyana. And in Guyana, he started the People's Temple Agricultural Project, a.k.a. Jonestown, where there he is in the middle right there, right in the middle of the jungle of French Guyana, well, Guyana, they built, they were going to build this commune, this paradise away from the greed and the avarice of America where they did not understand you. But there were stories about what was going on there. But, you know, I actually remember tidbits of this. Little tidbits. Must have been on the news or something. Because um, I was about 10 when they first went down there. And 11 or so, 12 years old. But then... That. And then they were all murdered. They'll say it's mass suicide. They were. And they were all killed. And my parents got Newsweek. That's back when magazines. You ever heard of magazines? The, you, the thing, and they have like words and pitch. So weird how fast magazines run away. Magazines where you got news because you could not get in depth stories anyplace else. And now you just can't get in depth stories. <laughs> but yeah, I can. Right, we have that magazine. That's still very vivid in my mind. That cover of the bodies bloating after the. Well, they'll say suicide, but they were murdered. Hundreds of them. That's on time. Now pictures of families huddled together, all dying. All dead. And cults were either the scary Manson cult or the almost seemingly harmless Harry Krishner. This turned it into something else. It's no coincidence that, yeah, Terry Krishner was doing it, but that's why they banned it from airports. And that became a national way to stop cults. And when I was in high school, there was this whole thing about like the devil worshiping cults. Shut up. Devil worshiping <laughs> cults all over. And it was, that was, we lead to something like this. Now, that was 99.999% garbage, but just this fear and talking about it all the time. I don't think that happens now. I mean, I, you know, a little bit, you probably heard about him. Yeah, that's true. Don't say, hey, that's what you're going to call. Yeah, yeah, people sign. Okay, and then, and then, like we mentioned, and everyone knows what it is. It's a pretty negative, it's kind of scary, but clearly there has to be an appeal to it. And this shows you how the appeal works, and it is so right. We're going to watch a video. The American Experience did this for PBS, and it is. Really well done. It's a style of documentaries that they started doing about 20 years ago. Now there's a lot doing it where they don't actually have a narrator. They have the people who are being interviewed. And that has limitations. A lot of them aren't very well done because you miss parts. This is one of the few that does it perfect. It hits it right on where you can follow the story. And it's it goes through the beginning, how we started and the positive elements of it. And that's what we're going to watch mostly for the rest of today. And there'll be a few things I want you to get notes on. And then on Monday, we'll pick it up again. And I'm going to tell you now, and I'll tell you again on Monday. Now, this is something they showed on PBS, on public television. But there are going to be a few words. And there will be a turn. And how they do the turn in the movie, where all of a sudden it's like, seemed relatively positive and it doesn't. And it will be a shock. Don't hold back, and you will see, and it will hit you like that. Actually, that's what makes it so good. Now, normally you say, don't tell us. No, you understand why I have to tell you that something is coming. You three know exactly what I'm talking about, right? 
and it does hit you like a Mack truck. And so, this is one of the best of these kind of documentaries I've ever seen. And so, it'll cover the story, and it's a great way. And I'll stop and I'll add a few things, but it's very good. So, we'll watch this, and the way it finishes, so well done. There's a few other ones that aren't bad. There, I think there's, a, there's been a couple really bad movies, but there, there's going to be another one come out that supposedly there, it's going to be like a, a documentary, but they're going to do like, dramatize things. And, We'll see. Maybe it'll be better. They did one for the Mansons, and they made a big deal how great it was, and I watched it, and it was horrific. It's just silly bad. So, play it by ear. You never know. And that is one last one, and all ages. And it's one of those fisheye cameras. So, National corporate funding is provided by Liberty Mutual and the Scotts Company. Additional funding is provided by the Ford Foundation. American Experience is also made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. So eight, possibly. 1978. Okay, you hear it, mass suicide. You hear it all the time. It's not suicide. Nobody joins a cult. Nobody joins something they think is going to hurt them. You join a religious organization, you join a political movement, and you join with people that you really like. I think in everything that I tell you about Jim Jones, there's going to be a paradox. Having this vision to change the world, but having this whole undercurrent of dysfunction that was underneath that vision. Some people see a great deal of God in my body. They see Christ in me, a hope of glory. He said, if you see me as your friend, I'll be your friend. As you see me as your father, I'll be your father. He said, if you see me as your God, I'll be your God. Jim Jones talked about going to the promised land. And then pretty soon we were seeing film footage of Johnstown. Rice, black eyed peas, Kool-Aid. We all wanted to go. I wanted to go. People's Temple truly had the potential to be something big and powerful and great. And yet, for whatever reason, Jim took the other road. On the night of the 17th, it was still a vibrant community. I would never have imagined that 24 hours later they would all be dead. Die with a degree of dignity. So lay down with tears and agony. It's nothing to death, it's just stepping over into another plane. Don't don't be this way. I vividly remember the first time that I met Jim Jones. My sister Carolyn had invited my parents and my younger sister and I to visit her in Potter Valley. We came and there was this strange man in her house and her husband wasn't there. Annie and I were sent out to go on a walk. When we came back, something had happened. Something terrible had happened because everyone had red eyes except for Jim Jones. We didn't really get the story until we were in the car going home. He was carrying on an adulterous relationship with my sister. And because his wife couldn't relate to him as a wife, that Carolyn had taken over that role. Everything was plausible, except in retrospect, the whole thing seems absolutely bizarre. The 
first time I visited People's Temple, I drove at the urging of a friend and um, co-worker to Redwood Valley. We all got suited down, neck tied and everything, and, you know, and uh, we were sharp. As soon as I walked in to the San Francisco Temple, I was home. <laughs> I was one of those kind of guys that um, I used drugs. I was an alcoholic. I drank alcohol and stuff like that. And and all these these people that that were like my age, they were clean. <laughs> Before I came here, I was taking LSD, marijuana, every type of dope you can imagine. Without our pastor Jim Jones to teach me the right way, I would not be in college right now. And for me, that was like, wow, man, I like this. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. It was an interracial group. The choir was interracial. And they used to sing this song. Never heard a man speak like this man before. Never heard a man speak like this man before. All the days of my life, ever since I've been born, I never heard a man speak like this man before. After they sang one or two songs, the whole place was lit up. The People's Temple Services, they had life, they had soul, they had power. We were alive in those services. I would be up jumping in the balcony and clapping my hands. If you came in as a stranger and didn't know anything about the politics, you were thinking you were entering an old time religion service. By the time Jones did come out to do his speaking, the, 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 the table had already been set. I represent divine principles. Total equality, a society where people own all things in common, where there is no rich or poor, where there are no races, wherever there's people struggling for justice and righteousness, there I am, and there I am involved. What he spoke about were things that were in our hearts. The government was not taking care of the people. There were too many poor people out there. There were poor children. The world is like a human family. The little child may not be able to go and draw a paycheck, but the father guarantees the child care. The grandmother may not be able to work anymore, but the father and mother guarantees her the right to live. Every single person felt that they had a purpose there and that they were exceptionally special. And that is how he brought so many young college kids in, so many older black women in, so many people from diverse backgrounds who realized that there was something bigger than themselves that they needed to be involved in and that Jim Jones offered that. I went home, told mom, you know what? This is the right church for me. It was the next week that I became a member of People's Temple. There's a little town in Indiana. The moment I think of it, a great deal of pain comes. As a child, I was undoubtedly one of the poor in the community, never accepted, born as it were on the wrong side of the tracks. I grew up with Jimmy Jones. We started first grade together. My brothers used to go over to Jimmy's house and hung around uh, his barn, which was where he played. From the time I was five years old, I thought Jimmy was a really weird kid. There was something not quite right. He was obsessed with religion. He was obsessed with death. My brothers came back with stories of him conducting funerals for small animals that had died. 
a friend of mine told me that he saw Jimmy kill a cat with a knife. Well, having a funeral for it was a little strange. Killing the animal was very strange. Killed it to have the funeral. Jimmy's father did not work, did not have a job, and was a drunk. Jim's mother had to work in order to support the family. And he was kind of left to his own devices. You know, kind of the kid who ran wild in the street, you know what I mean? Listen, he was in a dysfunctional family. <laughs> we got a nice name for it now. But when you live in a dysfunctional family, you think it's normal. Feeling as an outcast, I'd early developed a sensitivity for the problems of blacks. I brought the only black young man in the town home, and my dad said that he could not come in. I said, then I shan't, and I did not see my dad for many years. In Lynn, Jim Jones looked for community and couldn't find community in Lynn as a town, which had a population of, what, a thousand people. But he did find community in the Pentecostal church. He saw that they were a surrogate home. He saw that the preachers were like father figures to their congregations and that role represented power over the lives of your congregation. Jim Jones started out on the revival preaching circuit, learning the ropes of being a preacher, and once he started doing that, it became clear that he could get a following. The first time I met Jim Jones was Easter 1953. My mother-in-law, Edith Cardell, had a monkey and it hung itself and she wanted to replace the monkey. So she looked in the Indianapolis Star and in that Indianapolis Star was Jim Jones's ad that he had some monkeys to sell. So it was through that that she met Jim Jones and came back saying that he'd invited her to church this next Sunday. What a great way to get to know people. It didn't make no difference what color you were. There was everybody welcome there in that church, and he made it very plain from the platform. We had some people that disagreed with Jimmy that got up in the audience and then said they disagreed with him. They did not like this integration part of this services. We did ask people to leave the church one night because of that. I was the first Negro child adopted by a Caucasian family in the state of Indiana. Jim Marshland actually went to adopt a Caucasian child. The story goes that I was crying real loud and it drew, it, it drew attention from Marshland to come over. And um, once she, she picked me up, I um, stopped crying. My family was a template of a, of a rainbow family. We had an African-American. We had two American, Asian, and we had his natural son, homemade. Jim was uh, breaking new ground in race relations at a time when the ground was still pretty um, hard against that. Jim Jones was um, hated and despised by some people, particularly in, in the white community. There had been pressures on him to, to leave Indianapolis. He thought that Indianapolis was, was too racist of a place for, for him to, to, um, to be, and he wanted to take his people out. California is perceived to be a very progressive state. This would be the place to implement the dream of racial equality, not Indianapolis, which seems hopeless but California, which seems to be the promised land. He chose Ukiah in Northern California, about 90 miles north of San Francisco, because there was an article in Esquire magazine that said that Ukiah was one of the nine places in the world that in the event of thermonuclear attack, 
people would survive. I told Edith, if you follow Jimmy to California, you're crazy. So what did Jimmy do but took it to a psychiatrist and sent me a certified letter that she is of sound mind and she is not crazy. I was there the afternoon that Edith drove away. I didn't know I'd never see her again. And so then with the Akaya, little town in the vineyards, beautiful area. The move to California was really fun. There were about 12, 15 cars driving across the United States and making that journey to a place none of us knew, you know, uh, none of us could even imagine. We were going to California, our new world. When I saw Redwood Valley, I couldn't believe my eyes because it was like a paradise. It was rural, it was green, uh, there were grapevines everywhere, and I fell in love. I said, this has got to be a perfect way to live. We started with about 141 people, and from that we've grown to a very thriving congregation. We have about every level of society, all socioeconomic income straight in professional down to the ordinary field worker, field labor. Uh, really, it's beautiful to see that all these divisions have been broken down, not only race, but any differences of economic position. The focus of Jim's message was the uh, taken from the Bible, where Jesus, in his earliest days, uh, told people to sell all things and have all things in common. Jesus Christ uh, had the most revolutionary teachings uh, to be said in the sense that he said to feed the hungry, clothe the naked, uh, take in the stranger, minister to those the widows and afflicted in their suffering. And we feel that no one really tried Christianity too effectively or the Judeo-Christian tradition. The membership increased substantially as he procured more and more Greyhound buses and uh, fixed them up. And every summer he began this cross-country tour. The purpose of the bus trips was to spread Jim's beliefs about socialism and the world and how we can live a better life and about an integrated lifestyle. But behind that, I think it was to gather more members for the temple. I decided not to go to Vietnam. And I was just the point of what am I going to do with myself? I heard Jim Jones is going to be coming to, to Philadelphia and coming to Benjamin Franklin High School. And I went Wednesday night, I listened to him, and I was impressed by how it was such an interracial group and people were really happy. You got nothing to lose. Who else is going to stand, look you in the face and say, come and I'll give you a job. Come and I'll give you a home. Come and I'll give you a bed. I got nothing but pension. Go and leave your pension behind. Who else will tell you that? Who will tell you I'll put you on that bus tomorrow? I heard Jim Jones talking about equality among races, what it's like in living in, in California and in, in the Redwood Valley, uh, the good works that they're doing, things that like I wanted to get involved with but didn't even know where to make an entree. And all of a sudden, the answer was there. 